क्या है हेलो वेलकम टू द साइकोट्रिक ग्रैंड राउंड्स फॉर टुडे सितंबर 12 um it's not that long here uh we're really excited about the speaker today uh Dr. Joseph Newman um he graduated from the University of Missouri at Columbia clinical psychology program in 1975 uh and obtained a certificate in biblical counseling from Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation uh, at Westminster Seminary in March of 1984 he received a healthcare management certificate from ETSU in 2006 Uh, he has had clinical experience with a variety of populations including substance dependence, the intellectually disabled, community, outpatient children and adults. He is retired from the VA Medical Center in the state of Tennessee. On Mondays he has a part-time private private practice at Grace Point Counseling Center, a Christian counseling facility in Johnson City. He is a licensed psychologist in Tennessee and North Carolina. a lock member of Christian Association for Psychological Studies, a ruling elder at Grace Reform Presbyterian Church, and a certified biblical counselor through the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors. He will be speaking to us today about chronic pain, Christian biblical counseling principles and practice. Thanks for speaking with us, Dr. Newman. Thank you. Good morning. I appreciate your coming and taking your time this morning to be here. Um, and as sort of a, a welcoming gift, if anybody is interested in a printed copy of the handout, please raise your hand. I have. Okay, good. Let me go ahead and here's a couple there. And here, oh, my hair. Do you mind? It's good cardio exercise to go back and forth. Okay. You got to expect me to come up there, aren't you? <laughs> you do the right work. Okay. That sounds like are you okay. There you go. Oh, I think there's another lady out there. Okay. There. Okay. I think that's everybody who raised their hands. If uh if you if somebody does come later on and they're interested in more, I've made a few copies here and you're certainly welcome. uh to uh, look at that there actually last night i noticed two uh, corrections which you'll you'll be responsible for putting in on your own but uh, and i also understand that this is available through the uh uh through the Conti- office of continuing uh, medical education now uh it's always funny having a disclosure statement in reference to something like this I you know there as far as I know there's no political advocacy group related to Psalm uh, 73 or anything like that but uh, uh this is it Okay what are the objectives why are we doing this morning and uh and what are the main purposes first of all there will be a review of uh, some empirically uh, oriented research that relates generally to theistic uh uh therapies uh, psychotherapy counseling kind of interventions and then we'll be exploring some of the particulars related to Christian biblical counseling what I mean by that and and then more particularly how it applies to a specific area related to uh, chronic pain and I understand I mean if surveys are accurate probably most individuals in the audience probably don't agree with the uh world and life view or that I'll be presenting here statistically speaking there's a, a limited number in an academic uh audience but for the purpose of this presentation I'll be listing some values and I'll ask you just to assume that it doesn't mean you're endorsing it just because you're sitting here Now there's a reason for chronic pain and when I ha- need to think of a topic I had an interesting experience with this booklet and it's a chronic pain biblical counseling booklet written by a a biblical counselor and physician I had more positive response to this booklet I had uh two people used it as part of their Sunday school classes one person used it for a 
a, a weekday uh, Bible study. Another person said from Carter County said she talked to everybody in their holler about the booklet. So it was very well appreciated, and that and was seemed to be helpful for the individual. So chronic pain seemed to be a relevant topic. You know, in addition, during other days of the week, I do a lot of pain evaluations for four different neurology and pain clinic groups uh, related to use of narcotic medication and, uh, and also uh, some preoperative evaluation. So chronic pain is part of what I do. I do hope this helps in terms of the cultural sensitivity issue, even though statistically I assume most people don't agree with some of these values. Uh, you may note that met some of the patients that you see do advocate that, and I would encourage you to consider it from uh, that perspective. Um, there's actually another study that was done that indicated that over 80% of those uh, patients, those clients who were uh, identified themselves as Christian, did want a counselor that did things like reference the Bible, pray, that sort of thing. So this isn't a uh, top-down kind of advocacy uh, kind of approach. This is recognizing needs for at least a subset of the population. And most professional groups, including psychology, do encourage people to be sensitive to the populations they're working with. There are several things that this isn't meant to uh, uh, do. First of all, I have no intention of converting everybody in this uh, audience to become uh, Christian biblical counselors. That's not the purpose. This is an idea of giving you some sense of what's going on and uh, uh, an appreciation of what might be involved in that. Also, uh, I do encourage those who aren't skilled or adherent to the principles to somehow add on. And I encourage everybody, no matter what your values are, to at least ask your your clients, how do they understand the world? You know, what do they see as their spiritual religious values when you do an intake assessment? For some people, it's very important. Just this past Wednesday morning, I had somebody say they really appreciated you know, being able to come, and I've seen this woman for a while, to you know, somebody who uh, knew the scriptures. And usually I have some response like that, that, you know, that they like having a counselor who, you know, knows God or knows the Bible or something like that. And so clearly there seems to be a need and some of these people have been to other individuals and even if they haven't said something, they recognize that there's a discrepancy between what their values are and the person they've seen. Also, or lastly, I do want to indicate that I'm going to be focusing on some specifics related to Christian biblical counseling and chronic pain. This doesn't mean that I don't think that establishing good rapport with people is important or that you shouldn't follow documentation procedures or any of those other things. There are many other things that go into uh, uh, actually doing uh, counseling and psychotherapy. And for the purposes of this presentation, I'll be using the term counseling and psychotherapy somewhat synonymously and also for the purpose of this presentation, since counseling is a word that can mean a lot of different things to many people, I'll be referring to a situation in which you have one or more people seeking assistance from one or more individuals identified as providing that assistance over a period of time, and let's assume it's an EAP kind of time period of, uh, say, five sessions, okay? Okay, now we have an article that uh, was published that did a meta-analysis, looked at multiple different studies, and looked at religious spiritual treatment, uh, which was desired by the patients or, or uh, clients. This was uh, published in 2011, it was conducted in 2010, and most of the interventions were Christian or Muslim-oriented cognitive behavioral intervention. That's a study by Worthington et al. The paper copy is over here, and you're certainly welcome to look at it after the presentation if you're interested in more detail 
than what I've provided in terms of this presentation. Now, there are several things about this study. Uh, first of all, all the studies that were used in the meta-analysis did use some sort of psychological uh, outcome variables. And one of them listed there is a Beck depression scale, measuring affect, a fairly popular kind of uh, outcome measure. Many of the studies also use measures of what's referred to as spirituality or religious commitment. And that's important because the word Christian can be used by different people and mean different things. And usually the different measures, like the religious commitment inventory, do talk about something that's a behavioral outgrowth of the belief, like attending church, giving money, praying, that sort of thing. So it's not simply, uh, you know, I'm a Christian kind of statement. And that's, a, that's helpful because the simply differentiating groups into Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish is not a very effective operational definition at this point in time. Most studies relied on self-identification, but some did require other criteria to participate in the project. And there were some types of programs that were excluded, 12-step programs, uh, med uh, meditations, and one-session workshops. Now, uh, well, it didn't go forward. Did it? There we go. All the studies that were included in the meta-analysis had an, at least a no treatment or an alternative treatment control group. There was random group assignment. And there were published and unpublished studies that were included in the meta-analysis. Uh, this resulted in 51 samples uh, from the 46 published studies. And here's the first typographical correction. D is a, it should be SD, which stands for Standard Deviation Metric, Measure of Variability. So D is an SG metric, and in this case, zero means that there is absolutely no difference between the treatment group and the, let's say, the control group. And, and the way this is presented, anything that's a positive change means that the religious spiritual groups did better. And for our purposes, everything this morning that's presented is going to be statistically significant, which means it has a probability level of 0 0.05 or, or uh, higher. Now, in terms of results, there are several of them. First of all, the spiritual slash religious treatment showed greater improvements than no treatment conditions for both types of variables. And secondly, the uh, spiritual religious psychotherapies had greater improvement than those in alternative um, uh, pr uh, procedures. Now, uh, there are, there were what, they did what was called dismantling studies with some of these, trying to look at specifics within the uh, population of what might be more effective. Um, and there were some comparisons in ter that were relevant. Um, so, for example, they tried to compare whether it's only the cognitive, CBT means cognitive behavior therapy, whether it was only the cognitive therapy was helpful. And in terms of the samples that they had with the population, there was no clear statistical difference in the psychological variables, the the uh, measures of depression, anxiety, whatever, but the spiritual uh, religious treatments did outperform on the uh, spiritual variables, the attending church, reading Bible, praying, that sort of thing. And there was a follow-up, and differences were maintained at follow-up, although the number of studies was notably smaller, and, and uh, there indeed were less of a clear change. Um, by the way, if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, there are some conclusions generally. First of all, the religious spiritual uh, therapies did work. Uh, that was clear. Uh, there was no clear benefit with the work that we have that there was any significant benefit differentially on symptom reduction. Now, that may be related to the small number of studies, types of variables, population. This, I reference another book here by Koenig and others that 
talks about physical health variables where you do find some differences. So I think it's a kind of a work in progress from an empirical point of view. The religious spiritual treatments clearly indicated some benefits spiritually. And uh, again, the response is that there should be an incorporation of religious spiritual values uh, that uh, follow the desires and needs of the clients. And therapists should ask about such values. Any comments so far before we go on the next session? Hearing none. Okay. These are some of the values that I mentioned are assumed as part of this presentation. This is relevant in terms of understanding things uh, when you're working with individuals. For, uh, and actually, when I do work at uh, Grace Point Counseling Center, people actually have a psychotherapy biblical counseling consent form that they sign that talks about things like values and any uh, confidentiality issues, my background, that sort of thing that everybody signs. And most, obviously, if you go to a Christian counseling place, most people agree to this. If it's not, then we have to talk about them. But these are basics in terms, and most, I think, evangelical Christians would probably agree with these. First of all, it says Christ uh, died as the only sacrifice for sin. And that means he functions as a savior and lord, meaning has some impact upon what our behavior is. That salvation isn't a function of things we do. You know, whether you wear lipstick or you don't wear lipstick or you smoke or whatever it is, that's not related. And there's Bible verses that relate to all these. Also, believe that God is personal. So it's not a situation where we believe that God is somehow up there, has kind of made the world and you know, goes on, has no impact. And there's a very obvious and big importance related to epistemology issues, namely the Bible. Christian counselors, biblical counselors, understand scripture, provides a way of understanding what ultimate truth is. And so it's our responsibility as Christian biblical counselors to know something about what the Bible says. And there are several things that are mentioned there because it's not just a plan of salvation. It also relates to how we live and how we understand things. The last point relates to what might be called major worldview differences, Renaissance versus biblical epistemology. Now, Renaissance would be an idea that how we understand th things is primarily <laughs> related to, I'm well wired, as you can tell, uh, it relates to how we understand things. And do we understand things from a primarily human perspective? So, for example, something is good if it seems nice to me, if it seems appropriate. Um, you know, is that our standard, or do we understand something as okay because the majority of population vote in a certain way? You know, what's our standard related to that? Or do we have something that's more absolute in terms of the epistemology, in terms of the scripture, how we understand what the scripture says and how we work that out? And everything that I've listed above is pretty basic. I certainly wouldn't want to say that there are sincere Christians who don't disagree on some aspects, but I think what I've listed is pretty basic. In general, in terms of philosophy, people talk about having uh, three phases, uh, three aspects, I should say. There's an aspect of epistemology. You know, how do we know what we know? There's an aspect of metaphysics. How do we understand the world around us? And then there's an aspect of ethics. How do we apply what we know to the world in which we live? So we understand coming into this that the biblical counselor has those foundational axioms in terms of dealing with issues. Now, there are several uh, basics in terms of Christian counseling procedures. First of all, we understand that sin is a real condition. It's not an insult to say somebody's a sinner or something like that. Or We want to identify patterns that are uh, sinful, that are uh, causing life difficulties. And we do that partly in the sense that we understand that's what provides hope. We understand that Christ died 
as a function related to our sins. He didn't die just to uh, help us out eternally or, or help us out in the sense of going to heaven. The primary purpose is a sacrifice, a substitutional sacrifice for sin. And again, this is defined as what we do or what we don't do. It's not based upon uh, my understanding. There, a couple of days ago, there was an article in the John City paper about a woman's understanding from her Christian background about abortion and other issues. And, uh, she may have an understanding, but that doesn't mean it's biblically based. Secondly, we understand that suffering and trials are real. There's nothing in this situation to indicate that people don't suffer, that they don't feel chronic pain, that they don't feel uh, clear uh, issues that relate to harming themselves in terms of interpersonally or that they relate to their family situation. We don't always know why that is. In this, from a human perspective, there's a section listed there, John 9, it talks about a man who was being born blind, and you know, why did that occur, what was the purpose? And obviously there are other situations, if somebody drinks alcohol for 30 years and they suddenly develop cirrhosis, we see a fairly clear cause-effect kind of relationship. But we also understand that God can cause suffering for a purpose. And you see some scripture verses related to Hebrews and 1 Peter there that relate to that. There's other principles too. Uh, Christians understand that not everything is something we know about. We understand God as being an all-encompassing, omniscient God. So there are things that we certainly don't know. We also understand that there's a way of handling things, that there's always a godly way of escape, as it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. People aren't left just to their own floundering, to whatever happens. It's not always pleasant, certainly not always fun, but that there is a way of handling it. And the goal of Christian biblical counseling is to apply biblical principles and procedures to problems in living. And mentioned chronic pain, depression, obviously. And there's a model in Romans 8.28, it talks about becoming more like Christ. That that's a model in terms of how we understand the ultimate goal. Now, specifically to chronic pain. Chronic pain, we understand as a bodily, physical discomfort. That's not to say that feeling Anxious can't be uncomfortable, uh, but we understand in this presentation that we're referring to some physical uh, illness, some diagnosable illness from a medical perspective. It is a subjective feeling. Uh, you may know of studies that have been done comparing, for example, individuals who were wounded in combat versus those having similar injuries in motor vehicle accidents and others. And there's clearly a different response to the injury and to the chronic pain secondary to the context in which the person experiences it. So we know that while pain is certainly a, a complaint, there are subjective aspects that impact upon both the frequency and severity of uh, those complaints. Also, generally speaking, people aren't neutral about it. Uh, they want it gone. People don't come to have spinal cord stimulators or pain pumps or narcotic medications because you know, they have nothing else to do. They want it done. They want it out. And, uh, but we also know that the motives can affect various agendas in terms of what's happening. And chronic pain is generally defined as pain that lasts uh, six months or longer on a daily basis. So this isn't a situation where you, know, you hurt yourself uh, and you, know, you, you go to the emergency room, you get treated, and, and then you feel better after two months. Uh, this is a longer kind of view situation. There are several diagnoses in the DSM-5, which is a new uh, diagnostic manual that relate to chronic pain. I have listed several of them, somatic disorder, NOS, psychological factors affecting medical condition. And there's a new one, which I've never actually used, uh, 300.7, illness anxiety disorder. So we understand chronic pain can be an aspect of several different complaints. Um, 
It's not specific in the sense that we might think of uh, visual hallucinations absent any physiological cause as sort of clearly pointing us to a schizophrenic uh, diagnosis. Now, there's a context in which we see this. We have, um, first of all, we understand that pain for most people is not useful. We want to get rid of it. And we also understand that medical science may provide us with some relief and temporarily benefit us. But this is the main point, the, the third one here, from a point, from Christian biblical counseling point of view, we tend to focus on ourselves during this experience and not glorifying God with the bodily state that we've been given. So typically, part of the role of the counselor is to kind of expand the person's view, to see a larger perspective, in terms of what's happening, in terms of the experience that they're happening, that they're experiencing at this point of in time. Now, the, the question might be raised, is it wrong to seek pain relief? And the answer is clearly no. Uh, pain, Paul uh, did actually pray, and there's 2 Corinthians 12 is listed there. It says he prayed three times for relief, and uh, he, he received a response, said, my, uh, my glory is sufficient for you, that there was not an immediate relief for that pain. Just because a person's a believer doesn't mean they're automatically uh, going to be cured from a <laughs> biblical point of view. We also do believe that counselors understand there's a, uh, there's a body, there's a physical body, and there's a non-physical uh, entity. And so we understand there's differences, and we certainly, anybody uh, should make sure that their counselee has engaged in some reasonable medical evaluation and care as needed. And typically, at least by the time people get referred to me, that's already been done. That's not usually an issue. Now, there can be various problems that occur. First of all, uh, we can ask ourselves what kind of methods that we use, um, whether we change ourselves. We understand, Christian biblical counselors understand that a person is a steward over their body. You know, how do they manage what they've been given? And we question whether or not pain relief focuses, becomes more in focus on, than, than the idea of pleasing God. And it's the idea of pleasing God that's the main focus in terms of a person experiencing chronic pain and providing counsel for that. Now, there are issues that uh, relate to biblical thinking in relationship to chronic pain. One is that we need to be pleasing to God and we don't, uh, don't want to see the use or the lack of pain relief to be a problem in the sense of hindering us to be more like Christ, like the Romans 8 reference I gave. Secondly, we do want to be uh, convinced that there's a goal, that there is something that we're supposed to work toward. We understand a plan, things don't happen accidentally, that there's a plan. And also, we understand that no matter what our situation is, whether it's a situation in which we have a terminal illness uh, or we're confined to a, a bed or it's a temporary problem, we, there's, a, there's a goal that we have and that is to please God and to understand what we can obtain from that strength. And we understand there's a purpose in suffering. Things don't happen accidentally. This isn't circular reasoning in the sense from a biblical point of view we understand things happen for a reason. We may not know what they are. So it's not really circular in the sense that you might think of it from a non-biblical uh, perspective. Now, in terms of general goals, we encourage the person to remove their mind, renew their mind. From a biblical point of view, the idea of what goes on in here is very important. And that's a function, it's a major issue in relationship to counseling that's provided. 
Um, people are encouraged to use the experience to grow in terms of their trust of God, their relationship to God. Um, and they're also in encouraged to think about why am I undergoing what I'm undergoing and to establish what you can do and what are the objectives to, to maintain and increase your abilities. Now, there's several means of doing that. Uh, journal or diary writing is certainly one of them. I use a diary form that uh, has a person write about one pleasant event, one unpleasant event, what happens before, during, and after, and also encourage them to relate a scripture verse if they can think of one, or if they don't know how to use concordance, show them how to use concordance in relationship to this so that the experience isn't simply isolated to their subjective sense, but has a broader realm of reference. Uh, physical activity. You know, obviously, this varies from one person to another person. Um, but uh, you know, certainly, we're created, we understand that we're created to do something. Uh, you know, Adam was doing something before the fall. It wasn't a consequence of that. So activity is encouraged, and that, again, can vary from one person to another. Also, there's an issue of uh, what is happening inside. For biblical counselors, the issue isn't just what the external behavior is, but what's the motive or what's sometimes called the heart issues related to why you're doing what you're doing or what are the reasons that you're doing what you're doing. Um, and then the issue of follows through maintaining responsibilities. Uh, and this can be sometimes very concrete. When I see people, besides talking to me in that 50-minute, 45-minute counseling session, they'll usually leave with some sort of homework kind of thing. They'll be asked to read something, to do something, to whatever it is, they'll leave. And I do that for a variety of reasons. One is for encouraging change, and, and the other has to do with issues related to what's the motivation. Um, but there's also a general goal of uh, the, what's called the fruit of the Spirit, and that's listed in Galatians 5, that we want to focus less on ourselves, more on other purposes. Now, we might ask when we do this, we've gone through these procedures, what's the goal, what's the function, what's the end results? Well, the end results relate to behaviors, thoughts, feelings that reflect something like the statement given here. Maybe I, can function, maybe I can't function like I want to, which of course is what most people reference, how they felt 25 years ago, um, but uh, I can uh, do things. I can still please God even if it's difficult, and we understand and identify the ways that that can be done. We do encourage people to be uh, biblically focused. That's what a biblical counselor does, is encourage some reference outside the person. And this also involves relating to other people. Congregations, are all, people are encouraged to affiliate with the church. So it's not an individualistic activity. Uh, people at Grace Point are referred by pastors in the area. They're referred by physicians. Um, and you know, they're, it's seen as an extension uh, of the larger church. There's nothing in here that would indicate that a pastor can't, for example, do some sort of counseling with their congregants. And since the, the 1970s, there's been actually increasing training in seminaries related to counseling kinds of endeavors of various sorts. But sometimes either due to past training or personal interest or uh, the nature of the particular problem situation, uh, referrals are made. And that's certainly appropriate, too. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Um, but there is a sense in which Christianity is more than just an individual, you know, I believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior statement. It's also a corporate kind of aspect. And again, the results should have a desire to please God uh, and 
encouraging others. And this references Psalm 37, uh, with no matter what we do, our motives and behaviors, etc. Now, another procedure is use of narrative. And there are different scriptures that relate to handling situations and problems. And one of the books of the Bible that's very large but also has a lot of content is called the Psalms. Psalms has a lot of information. Probably most people are familiar with the 23rd Psalm. Um, and it, it, this relates to how we handle problems. The 73rd uh, Psalm is particularly relevant in terms of some of this. If you look at Psalm 73, verses 1 through 13, it encourages you to examine what your focus is while suffering. That's the particular narrative. So you might have the person read it, go through that, understand the focus that the individuals have, and encourage people to think about, you know, how are they handling it? How are they related it? Asaph is the person who uh, wrote the psalm. Um, do I have struggles with bitterness, with regret? Uh, how do I handle things? And you can use this narrative as going through this particular psalm to handle things. So further through Psalm 73, uh, you carefully consider the conclusions. What's happening? What did Asaph notice? Does life reflect the professed belief? Does what we say we believe, is it actually uh, reflected in terms of the fruits or the, the actual behaviors that we engage in? Do we tend to think about pain uh, in a biblical way? Uh, sometimes people in pain situations can de develop a very narrow focus in life. Uh, and a more temporary basis, you know, if uh, I have four children, and when each of them was born, the time of delivery, you know, having it, life gets kind of small. It gets kind of closed into that delivery room. The, the immediate things that happen before and after. You kind of forget about the larger world in which we, we live. And that can happen in chronic pain situations too. Do we have idols? Now idols don't have to just be what we might think of the Old Testament kind of wooden figure or something. Uh, idols are basically things that we spend a lot of time on, uh, resources for, and most of us have a discretionary use in terms of time and money. And so we think about how do we spend our time and money. And certainly there are issues with uh, people uh, can uh, see a particular provider uh, as being the one that's going to save them. Um, I had yesterday I had somebody at Quillen who was very angry because he had a, had to have a knee op a knee amputation below the knee amputation and uh, you know, he was angry at the doctor you know why didn't the doctor catch that it's his fault and, uh, and there are other issues beyond this but there was a clear expectation and externalization of blame that related to it uh, Psalms, uh, we also recognize and confess and repent sin. There is a section in the Bible, 1 John uh, 1, 8 through uh, 10, that relates to the issue if we say we don't sin, we make God out to be a liar and his truth isn't in us. So we encourage people to recognize that because this is a lifelong thing. It doesn't simply happen as a function of the five sessions or whatever the person is seeing you. Lastly, um, Oh, not lastly, next to lastly. Psalm uh, 73, verses 17 through 24, we, uh, it, the narrative goes through viewing life from God's perspective. Um, we do consider uh, the issue of pain. Uh, we don't stand on our own. We, we recognize there's larger forces uh, that relate to this, and we confess anger, uh, in a, uh, bitterness, that sort of thing and look more toward an eternal focus. Now lastly, in terms of Psalm 73, uh, Asaph goes over the blessings for uh, the people. 
Uh, and again, this is used as a narrative kind of sense, going over with persons to understand their experience and how it relates to them. So again, we use the scripture in that regard. We look at the thinking patterns that are related to their understanding of pain. And we consider some of the practical benefits, as mentioned, some of the scripture benefits there, and the ultimate goal of uh, understanding and seeking identity with Christ. Um, and again, the issue of how do they view themselves, uh, what does scripture say about the situation? Now, biblical counseling isn't just related to chronic pain, as you can probably imagine. There are many other issues that I won't go into any detail, but basically there are many other issues that uh, scripture relates to in terms of problems, difficulties, and uh, while many of us may, whether we agree with it or not, may have an understanding of, of the Christian Bible's related salvation, it does talk about other kinds of things, other ways of handling problems and living that they occur. And these are some examples of some specifics, not meant to be exhaustive, but, um, and you can certainly read that and have a better understanding in terms of the scope of the approach. Um, now, in terms of handling things, um, uh, you know, the one thing that you, if you do see people on a regular basis, and if you have a percentage of your uh, clinical uh, population that you see that has some endorsed uh, Christian values and you're not a Christian, uh, uh, one thing that you might do uh, would be to have some resources that are available. I encourage clinicians to be open about what their stances are, how they understand things. I encourage you to, uh, uh, to look at yourself. Uh, most clinicians, I presume, interact with people who have some terminal illnesses, they have uh, issues that relate to death and functioning. And you should certainly have some understanding, have you understand that yourself in order to do a more effective job. If you don't, you run the risk of avoiding asking questions, avoiding of dealing with it, and then you end up having clients or patients who go away and uh, tell people like me that, you know, this counselor obviously didn't have a clue in terms of uh, issues related to death. Uh, and they're dissatisfied. So uh, I would encourage you to at least think about that. I've, I, again, I found some of these booklets as helpful. Um, and, and they're available in terms of other aspects that you might easily incorporate into outpatient kinds of counseling efforts. This is the bibliography that's been given. Again, the references are over here. And that's contact information. So for those people who uh, came in late, uh, I did hand out some uh, of the PowerPoint slides. Uh, if you came in late and you're interested, you're certainly welcome to pick some up. Also, uh, I understand it's available on the uh, uh, continuing med medical education site. Does anybody have any questions, comments, anything like that? Yeah. Um, just going back to the, uh, the slides about how uh, Worthington's meta analysis, uh -huh. did, did I understand correctly that um, the conclusion was that they found that the uh, subjects who had the theistic therapies uh, experienced spiritual relief but not actually symptom relief? They experienced both but there wasn't a clear differentiation when they did the parsing out of the approach. So when they separated just the cognitive behavior from adding from the, say, the spiritual, there was, there was a difference in the, let's say, the psychological, the Beck depression scale. There was a difference with both groups, but there wasn't a differentiation. So uh, the question, occurs then, does that mean that it's a function of uh, the number of studies in the sample, because the trend was positive but wasn't statistically significant, or is there actually no difference? So I think it's an open question, 
And as you can probably imagine, it's not, not a set of studies that there's a whole lot of research on. Um, it's, yeah. Identification of values and mm -hmm. value-based living. <clears throat> so, excuse me, I get a little nervous <clears throat> when I speak in front of a bunch of people. But I'm just wondering if um, uh, about your thoughts related to the fact that there is a relative um, paucity in the literature of the, with this type of counseling. If it if it might be related to um, journal editors' um, bias, if it might be related to uh, a relative lack of interest uh, within the, uh, with the individuals that, that practice these types of interventions to really even gain this kind yeah. of acceptance? Or, or okay. Well, there are several questions there. First of all, there are uh, procedurally there's some similarities in terms of what I understand with acceptance. Um, there's a difference in terms of the understanding of the ultimate purpose of life and where the epistemology or, or you know, our, our focus on God. So I, I wouldn't, they're not equivalent. Uh, uh, but, and then in the second part, in terms of studies, yeah, I mean, statistically speaking, there's, in terms of surveys, assuming they're still accurate, there's probably only about 5 to 7% of practicing psychologists who believe the same way I do. So you have sort of a small percentage. And then, of course, you have the issue of who's going to do the research. Now, uh, thirdly, uh, there may be some bias. I, I don't know of any literature related to it directly. I, I know of more literature related to problems in terms of hiring and who gets, uh, who gets tenure, who doesn't get tenure, that sort of thing. There was actually Rebecca Proust uh, had some studies that were actually published related to depression in uh, an APA journal. Uh, that related what she called spiritual religious versus regular CBT. And for Christian clients, uh, it was clearly more effective. So, uh, and it may be an issue of uh, what do we, uh, what do we uh, uh, try? You know, when I worked at the VA, um, we actually had a specialty program of one person, namely me, called Christian Biblical Counseling. You know, it was written. I also did the nicotine reduction group and, and biofeedback and some other things. But sometimes people don't request things, don't try things. In 2001, before I retired from the VA, the, the uh, government actually, and the first invasion didn't turn out to be as big as people thought it might be. but there was actually approval locally for uh, some Christian biblical counseling for reserve, reserve and guard units in the area that had been deployed. So, um, you know, sometimes we can limit ourselves in terms of what we do. But I also don't want to say there, there aren't issues. Yesterday I, I read somebody had posted a blog about some company that was now expecting their uh, employees to uh, indicate whether they they were allies, I think was the term, in terms of some homosexual values and practices. And it, presumably, if you weren't an ally, then there was a problem. So I don't know how accurate that was or not, but does that answer some of your question? Okay. Any other comments or questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, just a second. One other comment slash question. This, this is definitely an interest of mine as well, the mm -hmm. interface of spirituality and culture with mental mm -hmm. health issues. And it's, it's my understanding, and reading a bit about the history, I think it's called ACBC. Um, yeah, um, it used to be called NANC, National Association of Anthetic Counseling. Right. Nuthetero being a biblical Greek word related to confrontation or counseling. In, but I, I guess it's been my understanding no small controversy about the interface of biblical counseling with 
psychiatry and psychotherapy around the notion of um, biblical sufficiency, that the Bible alone should be sufficient for treatment and cure, and the J. Adams and other proponents that actually... Sounds like you are familiar. <laughs> Very good. That, that he's actually, um, at times, been dismissive of the notion, for example, of bipolar disorder, yeah. or the use, uh, uh, the use of medication for psychiatric illnesses. So yeah. I just was curious to hear... Sure. Well, first of all, uh, the issue rose. Uh, J. Adams uh, published a book in 1972 called Competent to Counsel. Prior to that, in the 60s, pastoral education programs pretty much used the, uh, an approach that was more humanistic, Rogerian in nature. That's what the training programs were like in the 1960s. He wrote this book that became quite a bestseller and encouraged pastors to say, hey, you know, this is really part of our calling. You know, what are we doing? How are we working on that? Now, in terms of, uh, so, now, then, and secondly, in terms of the second point you mentioned about, yeah, I mean, that's an understatement to say there's controversy between psychiatry and uh, Christian biblical counseling. Uh, yes, that's indeed has been going on. There's actually a book, I think, uh, titled uh, Secular Priest that was published in the 1970s that discussed the ways in which psychiatry uh, or mental health professions in general were allocating some of the historical roles that uh, ministers and others had. So it's been a controversy for a while. Thirdly, in relationship to Jay Adams, there are times Jay Adams uh, can be uh, exuberant. Uh, he can make a point, uh, and not everybody at Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation, which is by Westminster Seminary near Philadelphia, would agree with that. I mean, he basically was a leader in the area. And uh, uh, there's actually, uh, in, uh, I can't remember which book, Kings, there's a, a prophet, uh, Elijah, who had a situation with the prophets of Baal, and he sort of mocked them and made fun of them. And, and in one interview, Adam sort of compared himself to saying, you know, yeah, I know it's an exaggeration. I'm kind of you know, making the point. Uh, of course, that's been years ago. So, you know, things are, I think, uh, less, less confrontational. Uh, Ed Welch, for example, is a person uh, active, both a psychologist and a, and a Christian biblical counselor at CCF, has given presentations at uh, CAPS and a Christian Association for Psychological Studies and other situations. Um, now, in terms of the nathetic, or in terms of the medication issue, uh, ACBC, which used to be NANC, uh, has no statement about not using psychiatric medications at all. Uh, actually, if you go to a conference or read some materials, they'll mention that as an option. Generally speaking, uh, the encouragement is not to rely initially on the medication. It's to examine a person's you know, thought patterns, their heart motives, their interpersonal relationships, and not primarily go. The, the example being that, you know, if you drive a car and you suddenly have a red blinking light indicating you're out of gas or out of oil or something, you're going to handle it by smashing the dashboard or you're going to handle it by working on the problem. Now, most people would then say, you know, you, do an, you make an effort, we understand, you know, born in different situations and backgrounds and genetic makeups and all that, uh, and then there is a place for medications judicially used. I don't want to say that you can't find somebody in ACBC who would disagree entirely with that, but it's not a, sta it's not a stance of the, uh, of the organization. Does that answer your question? Oh, I'm pleased to know that you've Apparently, know some background there. That's very good. Any other questions or comments? Very good. Well, thank you. Have a good afternoon.